Welcome to the eighth session of the month of evolution. As you know from the previous sessions, this year we are holding the annual evolution days, online as month of evolution, and going international collaborating with every major. We started on Darwin Day, which is 12th of February, and will finish on 13th of March. We are so happy to share this period with you. We will start with Dr. Baer's presentation, then we will show Dr. Pierce's previously pre prepared presentation. If questions arise in your mind dur during presentations, you can write them to chat. Our question team will edit and forward your questions. You all know this year's event is organized in difficult conditions and we try to do our best as well as University Science Club students. Uh, we are grateful to all our, our speakers and participants for making the month of evolution happen these days. At this point, we feel the need to inform you. We are standing with our friends who got arrested during the protests against the non-democratic rector appointment that happened on 2nd of January. Although classes started two days ago, there are still 15 days left until the trial day of our friends. Right of education cannot be disrupted. We do not accept, we do not give up, and we will not bow down. In any case, we will strive to bring science to you. As Boas University Science Club, our goal is to facilitate access to science and accurate information to spread scientific thinking, hereby to contribute to scientific enlightenment, which is our common dream as we can. Today we are with Andrew Berry and Naomi Pierce from Harvard University. Uh, Professor Berry is the assistant head tutor of integrative biology and lecturer on organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard. Uh, professor Pierce is a professor of bi biology and a world authority on butterflies. Now Professor Berry will do his presentation and then we will continue with Professor Pierce. Welcome again Professor Andrew Berry. You can share your presentation and we can start. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. And I have to say, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, many of you will probably know that I come to Istanbul quite regularly to teach at Sabanja. I occasionally uh, make it across the Bosphorus to the uh, BU campus and uh, I'm very pleased to be here virtually, I have to say. One of the reasons, by the way, I come so regularly is because of you guys. Uh, Turkish students in my book are many of the best students on the planet. It's always a privilege working with you guys. But I would be lying if I said it was only the students because there are two other big draws. One is Istanbul is the greatest city on the planet. I love your city. And two, Turkish food is the best food on the planet. So that is reason enough to come. Anyway, I'm not here to t tell you about Turkish food. I'm here to tell you <clears throat> about uh, evolutionary biology. So what I'm going to do is share my screen and launch my presentation. Here we go. Okay, so as you know, there are two presentations. They're not really linked. Uh, I'm going to be talking in very basic terms about the process of evolution, and Nami's going to be talking about her beloved butterflies and specifically about what we can learn from butterflies. They've solved a number of really interesting biological problems. And I really appreciate the fact that this event is jointly hosted by uh, the Evolutionary Tree people and by BU. Uh, both very important institutions, both with a lot to say, I have to say. And I do want to just at the very beginning say a big thank you to Ije uh, for organizing this talk and for heroically uh, last night translating all the information on our slides late into the night. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the basic idea, Darwin's basic idea. And I'm going to show you something which I hope, it's going to be obvious, but I hope you won't have thought about it this way before. I want to show you that there's nothing mysterious, nothing scary, nothing weird about the theory of evolution. In fact, it's astonishingly simple. That's what I'm going to show you. That in fact, given a couple of very simple premises, it's inevitable. But before I do that, I do want to add our voices to the many voices which are objecting to the treatment of your university by the Turkish administration. 
I think this is a wonderful symbolic protest that faculty members are making. I know the protests are ongoing, and this is just to say that we, and I'm, I think I'm talking about the rest of the academic world, stand behind you in your protest, your bid for academic freedom. So that's one. That's uh, the university. The second institution I just want to mention briefly is uh, the evolutionary tree, <coughs> which does has done and is doing marvelous work in Turkey and now actually again across the world in removing, in eliminating misinformation put out by creationists. And as you can see, I take this somewhat personally. This is from Adnan Oktar's website. This is called Harun Yaya. They found a nice picture of me from a few years ago um, and uh, did a nice Photoshop job with an American flag, uh, which is ironic because I'm actually not American. I'm from Britain. But anyway, this is as close I'll get to being an American citizen. And there it is, imported pagan priests. No, people. This is a simple central idea. It informs all of biology. Do not absorb these fictions which are peddled by creationists. Having said that, I'm sort of sympathetic to creationists. Why? Because this idea explains so many big and important phenomena. Most importantly, explains us, where we came from, who we are our exalted, brilliant brains. What are we? We, Darwin taught us, are modified great apes. Modified great apes. That is the most seismic idea in the history of all of biology. It's an amazingly important idea. And, I, and you know, I don't blame people for being uncomfortable with that. What am I, just some kind of evolved hairy beast? Well, yes, actually. But that's the root, if you like, of creationism. That's the root of the discomfort with basic scientific ideas. What I want to do today, as I've already said, is persuade you that this idea of evolution is so simple. It's so inevitable that you needn't run scurrying into the woods for fear of the truths it contains. No, it's a simple idea. We've got to come to terms with that basic truth that we are, yes, just modified great apes. So as I say, a simple basis of a stunningly powerful process. And I'm going to just take, I'm going to sort of do this formally. We're going to take two propositions, two premises, which are completely obvious. They're inevitable. And see that the process of evolution, the entire process of evolution, follows from those two simple ideas. And the first of that is not controversial at all. I think you'll agree. Living organisms reproduce. We know this, right? Polar bears produce little polar bears. Penguins produce little penguins. Uh, three giraffes, a bit puzzled about the parenthood there, produce uh, baby giraffes, and so on and so forth. Living organisms reproduce. You know this. But this is the second piece. They don't reproduce, if you like, at random. When Mr. and Mrs. Polar Bear have a baby, they're not sort of wondering, is it going to be a giraffe? Is it going to be a penguin? No. Mr. and Mrs. Polar Bear are going to produce a baby polar bear, obviously. And why is that? Because, and this is the second piece, there's a set of information which is trafficked from generation to generation. You know what that information is. It's DNA. And that brings us to the second thing. It's a lot of DNA that informs the running of a complex machine, whether it's a polar bear or whether it's you. And that DNA is being replicated all the time. Now, your genome is approximately 3.5 billion base pairs long. You've got two genomes per cell, one from mum, one from dad. So that's 7 billion ASGCTGGGCT. And it's being copied all the time. You have probably around 50 trillion cells, most of which are in some phase of dividing. It's amazing the amount of copying that's going on. And that obviously includes the germline too. And you know what? 
mistakes occur. It's a thermodynamic inevitability. Given the fact we're trafficking information from generation to generation, DNA sequence, there are going to be errors. It happens. It's, in fact, it happens astonishingly rarely. We're really good. Well, biological systems are really good at limiting errors, but mutation happens. And you know what mutation is. Here's the supposed sequence. Something goes wrong, a copying error, and you've got to change. Okay, mutation happens. So that's the second thing. Organisms reproduce, mutation happens. And just to bang home this idea of mutation, I love this paper uh, from a couple of years ago. This is looking in humans at the essentially the mutation rate, the number of new mutations involved in the production of a new person, in you for example. And it, the, the, the exercise is stunningly simple. All they've done is take mum, dad, sequence mum's genome, sequence dad's genome, sequence junior's genome, okay, and play spot the difference. And as you can see, the difference is about per individual, about 70 new mutations per person, okay, per new person. 70 new mutations. And what's really cool is you can pass this into the source of the mutations, and this actually makes lots of sense. Blue is the mutations you received from your father. Red is the mutations you received from your mother. And this is the age of conception. So one, do not be Rupert Murdoch's offspring. He's up here. Women, of course, shut down reproduction courtesy menopause much sooner. So one, men keep going for too long, which is a mistake. Two, men produce more mutations clearly than women. Why is that? Well, it actually lies in the process of, of egg formation and of sperm spermatogenesis, producing sperm. Eggs, you're basically born with a full complement of eggs. There isn't very much cell division. There's not very much DNA replication going on. Whereas with sperm, it's constantly being generated. You're having at least constant replication, constant duplication of DNA molecules, therefore more opportunity for error. Okay, so those are our two basic premises. One, reproduction. Two, mutation. What does that mean? Well, what are the consequences? One is natural selection. And that, as you know, is the process whereby organisms become adapted to their environments. So this is the famous figure from Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle showing the famous Galapagos finches, these little birds on the islands with different sized bills, one for cracking big seeds, one for eating insects, and so on and so forth. The product of natural selection. The second thing I want to talk about, so these are the, these are the twin pillars of the evolutionary process, is speciation. Speciation is the process that results in the splitting of the tree of life. You've got one species, and then over time, somehow, it produces two daughter species. Now, we're all familiar with natural selection. We, uh, yes, of course, that's a key part of Darwin's thinking. But speciation? Speciation is equally important to the evolutionary process. These two are absolutely equivalent in terms of their centrality, the idea of evolution. Why? Think about a world without speciation. You have the origin of life, and natural selection is improving that life form until you've got probably a very good microbe, a very capable, multitasking microbe. But you've still only got one microbe, one species. It's probably spread over the planet, but it's just one species, not the 50 million we have today. So it's the splitting, it's the ramifying of the tree of life that is critical to producing the evolutionary process, and that's down to speciation. Okay, let's start with natural selection. And we're going to start with that premise that organisms uh, reproduce. And let's start with zebras, of course, because zebras are the best. I mean, look at them, black and white stripy equids, just too bizarre for words. But anyway, I love zebras. So we all know about the process whereby uh, reproduction occurs, it's exponential, right? So we start with very few zebras. Now, I'm assuming that we've got unlimited resources. We've got lots of zebra food and so on and so forth. What do we get? We get an exponential process. 
But, and you know this, not all populations are exponentially expanding all the time. Why is this? Because for any given environment, there's only so much food, only so many resources. You can only sustain so many zebras. We call this the carrying capacity of an environment, okay? So let's draw a line indicating the carrying capacity. So that's the limit. So what does that mean? It means... Ulum, lots of it, okay? This is inevitable. It's part of the natural world. Death, mortality. But who dies? Well, let's stick with our zebras. Um, and now we're looking at a distribution of how fast they can run. We've got slow-running zebras on the left and fast-running zebras on the right. And let's assume that there's some genetic variation which underpins these zebra performance parameters. So the fast-running zebras have fast-running alleles. The slow-running zebras have slow-running alleles. Well, look, you know what happens? You've just The line has arrived. The line is not going to bother with the fast ones. The line is going to eat the slow-running zebras. So what we have is death again arriving in the middle of this. But critically, and this is the essence of natural selection, but this is an outgrowth of exponential growth and the elimination of unfit individuals. This is selective mortality. It's the fastest running individuals that survive and reproduce. That means that the next generation is going to be enriched, enriched for these advantageous fast running alleles. That's natural selection, people. It's an inevitable consequence of the fact that organisms reproduce and resources are finite. Okay. Now, let's move on to the second pillar of the evolutionary process, which is speciation. I've already told you this is critical because without it, we would, wouldn't have diversity. We, wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't have humans. We would have one sort of boring but very capable microbe dominating the entire planet would be my guess. So what is speciation? Well, let's think about this in the context of our closest relatives our closest relatives of course are the chimpanzees uh, we our lineage split from the chimpanzee lineage probably about seven million years ago so what you've got is the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and then you've got gradual evolution over seven million years until you've got modern humans modern chimpanzees okay but where does speciation come into that process? We know we and chimpanzees are different species because we cannot interbreed. We cannot exchange genetic material with chimpanzees. Obviously, I can exchange genetic material with any member of Homo sapiens, and chimpanzees can exchange genetic material with any other chimpanzee, but we cannot exchange between the two species. So we, the term of art here is that humans and chimpanzees are different species. They are reproductively isolated from each other. So somewhere along that 7 million year journey, reproductive isolation arose. But how, where does it come from? How does it happen? And it turns out that it too is super simple. And it too is predicated on one of those two original premises, mutation. So here's the scenario. We're going to start where well, I've got one of Darwin's finches, a medium build finch at the top there. And let's say we have a parental population, which is the big yellow oval. And let's say we split this parent population into two geographically isolated daughter populations. So let's stick with the Galapagos. We put this population on island one and this population on island two. Now, to start with, of course, they're genetically indistinguishable from each other, right? I mean, we've just taken one population, split it in two, put one over here and the others over here. But what I'm interested in, what happens under this situation over time? Well, the first thing that will happen inevitably is mutation, right? So mutations over time will occur in each of these populations. And what's more, those mutations in each of these populations are going to be different. The probability 
that you get the same mutation in this population as you get in this population is close to zero. Remember, mutation is basically rare. Okay. So as time goes by, more and more mutations are going to accumulate in each of those populations. And they're going to be unique to those populations. So what this actually means is that as time goes by, so those two populations are going to become more and more genetically different. As different mutations arise in each one, and some of them will go to what we call fixation 100% in uh, that population. It will be a different mutation which makes it to 100% in the other population. So those are going to show up as genetic differences between the two populations. And at the bottom here, I've got the extent of genetic difference. So that's what we're measuring, the extent of genetic difference between the populations. So what happens is populations will become, over time, ever more different. And ultimately, that's what speciation is. It's once you reach a point where members of population A are too different to interbreed with members of population B, speciation has occurred. Okay, so how do we know if population, if speciation has occurred? Well, let's, let's do a, a thought experiment. Let's take a, a particular, to, let's say, let's see, has, are these two populations here at this time point sufficiently different that they're different species? Okay, so what we're going to do, simple experiment, we're going to take a male from this population, a female from the other population, we're going to mate them, or at least try to mate them. What happens? They have babies, okay? So they are still the same species. They might be genetically different, but they're still capable of exchanging genetic material and producing a viable offspring. Okay, so we have no reproductive isolation. Speciation has not occurred yet. Okay, but now let's travel further in time. Let's try such an event down here. Okay, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We've just allowed a bit more time to elapse. Male, female, mating. Look, no babies, no babies, no offspring. What does that mean? Reproductive isolation, speciation has occurred. And I'm sorry, uh, let's. I can't get rid of that, I'm afraid, I don't think. Yavru yok tuleshme. Speciation has occurred. Okay? And it's that simple. It's just the independent accumulation in two separate populations of different mutations so that the two populations end up so different that they can't interbreed. And so, and I've given you the example here, eventually you might have produced this fine build species from our medium build parental species and the big build species down here. Simple idea. Speciation is the inevitable byproduct of genetic divergence between isolated populations. Underpinned by our friend mutation. And that's it people. It is stunningly simple. We took two basic premises, reproduction, mutation. From those follow one, natural selection. You've got that exponential increase, but it doesn't happen, which means you've got mortality. Who dies? It's selective mortality. The best adapted individuals survive. That's natural selection. And two, over time, if you've got isolated populations, inevitably they will become genetically different. And eventually they will be so genetically different that they cannot exchange genetic material. They are new species. And that's it. That is all it takes for the process of evolution to occur. That's what I mean when I've written here. It isn't mysterious or complicated. It's exquisitely simple and this is the critical thing there's nothing there's nothing guided or weird or there's no background here it's inevitable okay uh, that's all i have to say let's um switch into uh naomi's presentation thank you very much for listening we thank you professor Berry. it was an enlightening speech of yours and now we will start Professor Noam Pierce's presentation on biomimicry. 
after that, uh, Professor Biryam, Professor Pierce will answer the questions together. You can ask your questions to chat. We are uh, editing. There is it. Hello. My name is Nomi Pierce. I'm very glad to join you today to talk about biomimicry and butterflies. A particular problem that we came across in my lab when we were studying lysinid butterflies, these are the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. Maybe a third of all butterfly species are in this group. They're rather small, but very brightly colored butterflies. You may have seen them in your garden. I, they interested me for my whole career because I'm interested in ants and symbioses with the ants and the caterpillars of many of the species in this family associate with ants. But that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about something that we learned, that we discovered that surprised me so much uh, just from studying the evolution of these butterflies. <clears throat> We've spent a lot of time looking at many aspects. And here you can see the a phylogenetic tree still in, in the works. There's so much diversity in many things, but I'm going to focus in now and really just talk about one group within the Lycaenids, and that's the Eumaeini. It's a, a very diverse tribe found in the Neotropics um, with more than a thousand species in this tribe. Um, and uh, the males are extremely brightly colored and beautiful and adorned with many um, sexual characteristics. In fact, when the these butterflies were first described um, in a classification by Elliot in 1973. He, he said, the Eumaeini, there's an unusually large number of different kinds of sexual secondary characters on the males. Things like, especially the aroma, a scent patch and a scent pad or a brush organ on the genitalia. And you see these if you study them, you, it's hard to miss the, um, on the wings um, of almost all the species, the males have these scent organs that they use um, to attract females um, and very beautiful. Um, they're unusual. The pads are unusual and found only within the Eumaeini and uh, a few relatives. Um, um, the, these are the pads that are thick. The patches, these are common and many butterflies have a pheromone patch. But the pad is unusual because it's a place where the membranes are not fused. There's a pocket in the wing. Um, and in the pocket is where the pheromone is made that is uh, wafted to females when the males are flying. Um, so you have the pad where it's a pocket and the patch where it's specialized wing scales on the patch. Um, and if you survey these butterflies, I, I, I mean, we went and looked at almost a thousand species and the great percentage of males, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the males, all have at least one of these pheromone organs on their wings or um, someplace on their wings. They're, the cartoon shows the different, um, uh, the different places where you can uh, uh, see the, 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 these pockets on the wing. Okay, so I was studying these butterflies and I got together with two friends um, from Corn um, Columbia University who are physicists. Um, and uh, we were interested in looking at the butterflies because we were interested in whether or not the butterflies could perceive and use signals in the near infrared. Um, this led us into a study of the role of, of heat regulation in butterflies. Um, that's because we, as we headed towards the longer wavelengths, which is where heat is um, and includes the near infrared, um, uh, we, as we started to look at all these aspects, we realized that that temperature regulation was one of the chief um, uh, most important features of the wings of these butterflies. So uh, this is just to remind you of this 
inf um, electromagnetic spe spectrum. And remember that we only see a rather small portion of the visible, um, uh, but which it, it goes all the way from UV, which we can't see, you know, straight through to near infrared and then on to microwave and radio and then fire at one end. So it's much bigger than what we actually can see ourselves. If we were insects, um, insects tend to be to have three kinds of three wavelengths that they their eyes are sensitive to. Um, uh, in the UV, many see in the UV and in the blue and in a longer wavelength that is maybe green, but there's a lot of variation and you can see on this graph um, for a, a plot of different insects showing this variation in the in the in the um, uh, photosensitivity of their eyes. This means that many butterflies may have these private channel communication where they can signal to each other in UV and a predator that can't see UV can't see them. Um, uh, and uh, so, so it often shows itself um, as a sexual dimorphism. Um, they often use them to recognize the right species um, in this kind of private channel way. And I'm showing here Coleus erythemi, a butterfly that looks identical to us to Coleus philodesi. But in fact, when the two are together, it's erythemi that has this uh, UV reflectance. Well, we were wondering, OK, so that maybe UV is a private channel. Well, what about near infrared? Maybe the near infrared also uh, uh, shows reflectance patterns on butterflies, but uh, um, we can't see them. And so uh, Nanfeng uh, Yu, my collaborator, um, who was a postdoc at the time and now he's a professor at Columbia, uh, started to look at this using this uh, uh, instrument that he um, he designed. It's a well-known instrument, but he designed a platform stage to be able to really look at the wings um, and uh, look at uh, reflectance patterns on the wings of butterflies. And it turned out that those scent pads and patches had very interesting properties in the near infrared. So um, if we look more closely at one of these wings, you can see that it's a very non-random over the patch. Um, those uh, scales on the patch are reflecting almost all of the light. I mean, they act like perfect black body absorbers. So they're, they're reflecting all the energy that's coming in uh, to that wing. Um, and um, and this is true because the wing scales um, at, across the wing of the butterfly differ um, in their emissivity to, of light, the, their, um, the reflectance of these, uh, these wavelengths. And that emissivity, the difference is because of the scales on the wings themselves. So here we're taking a really close up look at the wings um, and the wing scales. And here, just to give you a sense, we're looking down and you can see that the, that the morphologically, the, the, the scales on the pad and the patch, you can are, look quite different from each other. And if you were to pull off just a single scale, just one scale and start to explore it, you would see that the scales are structured very differently on the different parts and the different colored parts of the wings. Um, and we can take a focused ion beam to explore this even more. And now notice this is a tiny, we're at the head of a pin, but we can make a cut into the scale to look at the structure of each scale on the wing. And when we do that, we find that there's a very specialized structure um, on the scent uh, pad and the scent patch that enables that scale to um, to function like this black body absorber is when the uh, when the light hits those channels it goes into them and it goes nowhere it gets trapped um, so it's a, a, a amazing uh, device uh, because of the size of the channels going down. And um, you can look at this rather dramatically in a heating experiment. If you look on the left, we have an intact 
um, a, a wing with its scales, but on the right, we've taken the scales off. And uh, just from a heating cooling experiment, you can see that the, that the patch really um, uh, uh, functions in this way as, a, as, a, um, as an energy. Um, uh, what it does is it reflects, um, it reflects most of that light coming, energy coming towards it. So that in fact, what it's doing is keeping what's underneath, it keeps it cool. Okay. And what is underneath that patch? Well, it's really the living part of the wing. So the parts of the butterfly wing that are alive, um, uh, in other words, have um, living cells and aren't just membranous like the in-between parts of the wing. Um, the, the, the live parts are the ones that have this um, enhanced thermal emissivity um, because of the properties of the wing scales on the butterfly wing. Okay. So um, an emissivity is simply the ability of that object to emit energy in the in the infrared. So, and, and, and that's important because that's what lets the butterfly cool down. Um, we can see this if we look at a butterfly, a living butterfly with a thermal camera. And here, if you just look at, I mean, it's, um, there is the visible that we see, but if we take the thermal camera and look at it, you can see that um, the greatest reflection is happening over the wing veins and over that scent patch. In other words, the living parts of the wing are very much protected. Um, and why are they protected? Well, when a butterfly is under uh, sunlight, 50% of the energy of that sunlight is, is in the near infrared. So most of the energy that's coming down onto that wing is in the near infrared. So this ability to reflect that near infrared um, and, um, and passively cool in that way is, is super important. Um, now we wrote this up, we were excited about, it. we wrote it up and a reviewer said, what do you mean the wings are alive? How can you know that the butterfly, that, that, that those wing veins are alive? So we went back and we, and we had a closer look. Um, uh, and especially we looked along the wing veins uh, and we visualized all the neurons. If you think about it, when the butterfly flies, um, it has to be able to sense its environment and know where the wings are flying. So in fact, um, uh, the, the wings are studded with sensory receptors that uh, um, tell, the, tell the insect which direction the wing is going. And in addition to that, there are also, um, there's hemolymph, which is the insect blood that also um, goes in and out of those wing veins. So here we've just plotted the wing flow, um, the, uh, the hemolymph flow in Vanessa cardui, a common migrating species. Um, it was a question, what happens with the hemolymph? Over the whole life of the butterfly, is the, is the hemolymph flowing all the time in those wing veins? And the answer to this is yes. And here I can show you that um, uh, this um, uh, wing vein uh, action, um, this was on day 24. So is, it was close to the end of the life of this particular butterfly, but still the, the um, the hemolymph was going in and out uh, like a tidal flow. Um, uh, different species do it in different ways, but this one, it, it goes in and out. And I'm going to show you a, a movie of that flow, just to, uh, um, we've highlighted a little bit the hemocytes as they go through the, the veins, but here you can see top and bottom, four times speed. So. There, there, there it's flowing, now it's opening. So what we're looking at is the tracheal system, the breathing tube system inside the vein of the butterfly. And we're looking at the blood flow or the hemolymph flow going out 
and coming back in again. And it's, it, it is orchestrated to happen with the opening and closing of the tracheal tube, which is gathering air for the, so it's basically pumping air in and out and the, the hemolymph lymph is flowing um, along that wing vein. So undoubtedly alive, what exactly the hemolymph Hemolymph is doing is a very, we don't know because that it's not carrying oxygen. Um, as you all, all probably know, insects um, breathe um, by uh, diffusion. Um, uh, it's not uh, there. Here we can see it much faster. This, this um, uh, tidal hemolymph flow going back and forth, um, really quite uh, um, impressive. Uh, and very much timed with the breathing system of the butterfly. Of course, the, it, it breathes by passive diffusion of oxygen from the air, not by, well, they, um, not by uh, uh, hemolymph uh, the way our, our blood is. Okay, so these butterfly wings um, have a very non-uniform distribution of the thermal emissivity over different parts of the wing, the parts that are alive um, and the parts, the membranous parts in between that we can think of as more like our hair or not uh, no longer living. Um, but what we found was that this, this blood flow through the um, through the scent pad was unidirectional. So, so I've told you that the blood flow is tidal, but but through that scent pad, just through the scent pad, it's always unidirectional. And I'll show you here um, uh, again, sped up, and we're just looking at this blood flow through that scent pad, and you can see these bursts of hemolymph coming through, but always only in one direction. And we wondered, oh, gee, how does it, how does that happen? Because everywhere else is going in and out and in and out, but here, one direction. So <clears throat> uh, we looked more closely, and what we saw was that these butterflies have a wing heart. Um, uh, the wing heart uh, pumps; is it's in one corner of the of the organ, and the wing heart is pumping, 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 and it's bringing the hemolymph through. So I'm going to show you a picture of that now. Um, and uh, but it's it's very subtle. So you have to look carefully. Look at the picture on the left. And now watch the, uh, the, the pumping. Do you see there's the wing heart pumping to pull that hemolymph through the wing. And um, that tissue is myogenic on its own, it's beating on its own, and it's, it's right in the middle of the wing, and it's pulling the hemolymph in a unidirectional way. And why does it do that? Well, we think that the, it must be very important for the function of that organ to have these hemocytes bathe the tissues and uh, presumably removed wastes and so on. So on. Um, <clears throat> undoubtedly alive. Um, and that's the important point. So if we look at many different species of these butterflies here with the thermal camera, you can see where those, on all of them, on all these species, these are males that have these scent pads and patches in particular places. They're all a little bit different in different species, but you can see that they um, are closely allied with the wing veins. Um, this led us to think now of the butterfly wing as being a little bit more um, like a, a, a fast and sensitive um, temperature sensor panel. Um, in, in other words, um, uh, instead of just being something to fly with, it also is incredibly sensitive to temperature. And in this little video, we, we did many behavioral experiments, but here you can see this butterfly has, we've put a black paint on its eyes and antennae, so, so really it can't see the light that's being shown on it. But it, but it uses its wing like a a sensory panel and it turns to minimize its shadow. So here, as we turn, the butterfly is constantly turning to minimize its own shadow. Um, and it's doing that by using the wing as a, as a, 
a temperature sensor panel. Okay, well, <clears throat> no, this all seems very esoteric and rather interesting, but um, why would anybody take such an interest in this? And I wondered myself <clears throat> when the physicist took such so much interest in these butterfly wings, why? Um, uh, Nanfang, um, it, it, it's, it's all a, 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 an exciting uh, time for looking at nan nanostructures, especially if you're an engineer. So nan Nanfang got together with um, one of his colleagues who works on polymers and um, and by designing a polymer a suspension in a particular way, um, they could generate bubbles in the polymer polymer that were just the same um, size and shape as the as those channels in the um, in the wing uh, scales that we saw, and so that that uh, that, that polymer works very well to keep objects cool and why does that matter well basically the, the polymer is basically a paint um, and here you can see it going on um, and then creating these air voids by having the water um, evaporate and uh, making a network of these air voids that make it white okay so when we if if we sell you this paint it just looks like white paint like any kind of white paint that you might see but actually if you paint it onto a, a, here just a card as you can see here you see how how cool it stays even though the rest of the buildings here and this was filmed in Colombia they look very hot but the the card is very cool and that's because of this radiative um, cooling property or emissivity of the structure, the nanostructure of the bubbles that mimic the wing scales of the butterflies. Um, and uh, this can have very real consequences when you want. Good. <laughs> Video freeze, I guess, if you can share yeah. your presentation. Yes, I, it's so funny because uh, we taped it because we thought that was safer that way. Um, yes. And actually, uh, it looks like maybe we should have done it. <laughs> so I can narrate on, uh, on the presentation itself. Um, how do I share this uh, with you? Is it, uh, uh, I have the uh, presentation on my computer. Do I hit share? Yeah, share at the bottom share of your screen, screen Share at the bottom, okay. And uh, um, I wonder if I turn turn this first a video file share screen. Okay, um, it's easiest with two monitors, but I don't have the second monitor hooked up, so I'll just share it with my own um, uh, screen. So now you're looking at my computer screen. And I'm going to start that video. Just I'm going to try and start it more or less um, where we uh, where where we got frozen before. It's funny that we are that we've seen a lot of that butterfly now. And uh, um, is this all right? You, you can now see what uh, see see my uh, my screen. Yes. Not no. yet. Okay. Now can you see it? No. no. Oh, you can't? Oh dear, hang on. Um, forgive me for... Um, hmm, I wonder, oh, application window. Okay, I'll try it that way. Okay. Is this better? Okay. Ah, very good. Okay, now then we need to start this one. Yep, you're good. Now we okay. can All right, so this was just where the, where the screen froze before. And I talked for a long time about uh, this unidirectional flow that goes through the, the wing patch on the butterfly. Um, uh, and here you can just see a video of this happening. Um, uh, this, we've, we've added something to highlight the hemocytes as they go through to visualize them. Um, and we were very surprised because before we'd been looking at tidal flow and now there's a unidirectional flow. Um, uh, and we realized that the way that this flow was um, uh, orchestrated was through the wing heart on the butterfly. 
So down in the bottom corner here, I've circled where the wing heart is. And, um, uh, and so far we found them on all of these butterflies that have organs like this. And um, as I said earlier, it's very subtle. So look on the left, look in the, the bright spot on the left, and I'm gonna start the wing heart now. And uh, do you see these cells? Do you see the pumping? Um, so that pumping is myogenic. It's not under uh, conscious control butterfly. It's like your heart beating. Um, and, uh, uh, but that pumping is the, the action that's pulling those hemocytes through the organ and bathing the, all the cells in the organ um, with the hemocytes. So uh, it's very exciting to find this right in the smack in the middle of the wing of these butterflies. Um, and also gives you a sense of how important uh, it is to keep the, the pheromone uh, gland al alive and fresh so it can continue to attract females. Um, this is a, an, a thermal image that just shows with these five different species all in the same group of butterflies, this, uh, the distribution of those glands. You can see that they're different in each case. Um, but, uh, but quite closely allied to the wing veins themselves. Um, uh, and normally, um, other insects do have um, uh, wing hearts, but typically they're based right on the thorax. Um, whereas in this case, they've sort of migrated out to the middle of the wing, which is um, it's just an interesting and challenging problem that we're still looking at. Um, we did a lot of behavioral work, uh, uh, seeing how uh, butterflies modify their behavior now in response to temperature and heat. If you think of the wing as being like a temperature panel. Um, so this, this butterfly has had its eyes and antennae blackened um, uh, so that it can no longer, I mean, it, do, it doesn't see the light, but when we move, the, uh, move it uh, near, near the light, the, the wings detect the light um, as, this, as temperature and they are moving, it's moving to minimize its shadow. In each case, it's minimizing its shadow. Okay, um, now, now uh, I just got to the point of saying, it, this is all well and good if you like butterflies and it's, it's incredibly interesting physiology, but, but um, uh, why would this be of interest to a physicist like Nanfang? Um, uh, when Nanfang um, specializes in optics and he's very interested in energy use and more efficient energy use seeing as the uh, planet is in such terrible trouble and uh, we're uh, gobbling resources uh, so much. Um, and what he did was he got together with a, a polymer specialist at Columbia and they created a paint that mimicked the butterfly wing scales. Um, and uh, th this paint um, uh, keeps a, a, a uh, it, it, it creates bubbles. So here you'll see it going on as the polymer. And uh, as it dries, it goes white. Um, and it's going white because the water is evaporating from that polymer and then you're creating a network of air voids in the, in the polymer itself. So now it's white, like a white paint. But uh, what that means with the white paint is when you put it on the card, here we are in the bright sunshine at Columbia and you can see how hot the steps are and how hot uh, the building is getting during the midday sun. But note that that white card, that bright white card is completely cool. Okay, so just by that nanostructure, the tiny structuring of the, of the air voids in the polymer that are just the same size as what you get in the butterfly wing scale, you can create a paint that keeps the, um, the structure underneath cool through this um, uh, radiative cooling process. Um, and uh, and the, the uh, important feature of that is that you can use this paint like a white paint and paint it onto buildings. And when you do, um, it keeps the building cool underneath. And so in the, in the summertime, and they tested this in Bangladesh and Phoenix and New York City, um, if you paint it onto a building, you can reduce the cost of air conditioning by 30%. So this is a very significant savings and a very good uh, significant savings of energy of the, uh, of the electricity needed to uh, run those air conditioners. Um, and so um, it's a, um, and, it, and it's all an innovation 
coming from looking at these scales on the butterfly wings. Um, so just to summarize then, um, we found evidence for this, these living components on the wing. We found um, uh, structural mechanisms to cool the different parts of the wing from the nanostructure that um, the, the microscopic structure of the scales on the wings and also the, those scent pads. We found mechanisms in the behavior, the turning of the wing, the turning to minimize its shadow, um, uh, uh, to keep itself cool. Um, and, uh, and all of this uh, inspired the development of a paint that uses those same properties of radiative cooling or emissivity that the butterfly has um, uh, to, to cool down buildings um, in New York. And uh, I would say, you know, the relevance to evolution of these uh, findings is that uh, these butterflies have been at it for, you know, millions of years, maybe uh, we, we estimate 14, 15 million years. So, um, so selection has favored very, very specialized adaptations that work extremely well. Think how tiny the scale of that insect is. Think how tiny these glands and how thin the, um, the membrane with the living cells underneath. So selection was very strong to create a, um, a, a flat surface that could nevertheless uh, still keep what's underneath it cool enough to survive. And, uh, and that's what biomimicry and the whole um, sort of rage of biomimicry is all about. It's taking innovation from evolution and harnessing it for use uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, for all kinds of human uses. And okay, I think maybe I'll stop there and stop sharing too, um, if I can, I'm not sure. I have to stop sharing. <laughs> There's my lab group. <laughs> These people have all contributed partly to this work. Um, and, uh, and I will return it now to the um, regular program. There we are. Did that help? I, I hope that I'm sorry about the, uh, the, uh, the video stalling. That's uh, funny because we, we, uh, we filmed it because we thought maybe those movies would slow down. Um, I think it's my uh, problem about my laptop. It got extremely hot <laughs> and I didn't even <laughs> stop the sharing. Uh, I was sharing the video. See, uh, thank you, Dr. Pierce, again. Uh, but both presentations were extremely intriguing and raised some questions. Our team has edited the questions asked so far. You can still ask questions. We will forward them if time remains. Uh, so if our present professors and the question team are ready, we can begin the question and answer session. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with the first uh, question. And I, I want to thank you, uh, both of you, uh, for participating in our event. Uh, and this is actually my question for Professor Berry. Um, we know that you're also an historian of science too. Uh, why is your main subject is on Alfred Russel Wallace? Can you as explain briefly for our audience? Uh, certainly, it's always a pleasure to talk about Wallace. So everyone knows about evolution, whether they like evolution or not, they know about it. Either they hate it, they're creationists or they're scientists and they think it's a good idea. And what, name do we associate with the idea of evolution when you google evolution what face comes up i'll give you a clue it's got a big forehead and a big beard and looks kind of sad charles darwin and of course darwin is the founder of our field of science evolutionary biology and is an incredibly important thinker what people don't realize is that this idea was discovered yes by darwin absolutely but by another person as well, simultaneously. And in fact, the original description, the original publication, which we, as you know in science is what matters, is the publication of the theory of evolution by natural selection, has two authors, Charles Robert Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. So Alfred Russell Wallace was a much younger man. He was a rather obscure. He was a, a collector. He was traveling in Indonesia collecting specimens. And he was thinking about the issues of the day. And he, this is the luckiest thing that ever happened to Charles Darwin. 
he had the idea, which now we recognize as natural selection, and he sent a letter to one of his scientific heroes, one of the few connections he had in the big world of science, namely Charles Darwin. And that's the luckiest thing that ever happened to Charles Darwin, because if Wallace had sent his manuscript to a journal as he normally would have done and it got published, Darwin would have been scooped. Darwin had been working for 20 years on this idea by this stage. So they co-published, and then Darwin rushed out The Origin of Species, which came out uh, just a, a year later. So the, the co-publication was in 1858, and uh, The Origin of Species came out in 1859. So this is a bit like Watson and Crick, right? Darwin and Wallace. What? It's not like we've lost Crick or Watson. What's happened? to Wallace. And that's just a really interesting question. He did lots of other important science. It's not like he sort of disappeared or died young or anything. In fact, he lived until 1913. Um, what is um, part of the story is he always deferred to Darwin. He said Darwin thought of this first. Darwin was the, 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 the first person on this idea. So, for example, when Wallace wrote his big book about evolution, which he actually came much later, he was going to write a book about evolution, but then he discovered that Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, so he stopped writing his book. He waited until the late 1880s. So Darwin was already dead when he wrote his sort of his version of The Origin of Species. What did Alfred Russell Wallace call the book that he wrote about his co-discovery with Charles Darwin? He called the book Darwinism. Yes, sadly, he has been forgotten, but it's unjust. And thank you for bringing that up, AJ. We should remember. Great guy, interesting guy, great thinker, great scientist, great human. Thank you for dancing. Um, I'd like to thank you both for the uh, amazing presentations. Uh, they were very interesting, and I have a question for Professor Pierce. Um, although there are many fields in biology, why did you choose biomimicry and especially butterflies? Is there a story behind it, and what is so special about butterflies from your perspective? Well, I didn't really choose um, uh, butterflies per se. I was interested in symbiosis, um, uh, uh, organisms living um, together. Um, especially um, cooperative um, arrangements and and the the caterpillars of um, maybe 70 80 percent of those butterflies that I showed you have a elaborate symbiosis with ants so um, in fact uh, in fact most of my lab studies symbioses with ants and uh, sometimes I, I go back and forth between being a butterfly um, enthusiast and, a, and, a, and an ant person, um, uh, and uh, so, the, so the interest really arose uh, from that. Uh, I, I like studying insects. I do uh, find uh, because they're 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 so amazingly diverse, um, and I love um, right now. I, I feel like I've done a second PhD. Um, this is uh, looking at the at the color patterns. Um, uh, on the wings of the butterflies. We call this wings and wavelengths. So we're interested in, in um, what's shaping those color patterns. And, and here, it, um, it temperature plays more of a role than people realize um, uh, before. But also we're interested in, uh, can, the, can the butterfly see uh, some of these signals that we can't see in, in these longer wavelengths? So we've also been looking at the visual system of the butterflies, um, uh, which I, is a subject I didn't, couldn't go into, um, but uh, we we just had a, a paper in um, um, uh, the Proceedings of National Academy, which you can see if you if you want, where we where we take we look specifically at the visual system of butterflies and whether or not um, uh, these these ones of interest can can see into uh, the long wavelengths like red and near infrared, and the answer is uh, definitely yes. And there's some very um, uh, very nice techniques we can use to look at the at the opsins or the visual proteins in their eyes. So, so it's endlessly fascinating. Thank you for the answer. Uh, this question is for Professor Berry. Uh, how can we help Turkey to become a more open-minded country like UK and care about science more? Because in some parts of Turkey, even the mention of evolution 
can cause death threats. Uh, how can we cope with this narrow-mindedness? That is an amazing <laughs> and rich and complex question. Um, one, I wouldn't give the UK too much credit, to be honest. Um, the UK has plenty of problems as well. Uh, unfortunately, the the problems are global. But I hear you. Uh, in uh, Turkey in particular, evolution is a hot-button topic. And the reason is the same reason it's a hot-button topic in the United States, for example, where there's a very strong creationist movement. Of course, it's an Islamic creationist movement in Turkey, and it's a Christian one in, in the U.S. But actually, they, they translate each other's literature. They're sort of kind of the same thing. The reason it's such a big issue is people think that there is a dichotomy. The either you, if you like, accept Darwin's ideas, well, let's say Darwin and Wallace's ideas, or you have religious faith, whether that's in Allah or in God or whoever. Okay, It's either or. That's the perception. And by the way, there are plenty of scientists who would promote that perception. Richard Dawkins would say it's either or. Either you go to church or the mosque or to temple or whatever, or you're a scientist. And the same with your preacher or the imam or the, the vicar, the, the priest will say the same thing. It's either or. And that's the popular perception. So that's why there's pushback, because people think that if I accept scientific ideas, then I have to eliminate, I have to remove my religion, which is a cornerstone, an important part of my existence. Look, you've just had Ken Miller come visit. He's a fantastic antidote to this thinking. It, this is the answer to the question. We have to get rid of that either or thinking and make it clear to people that it's perfectly possible to be a completely doctrinaire scientist, yes to Darwin, yes to Wallace and so on, and also to have a deep personal religious relationship with the divine. And that is a difficult argument to have, but I mean, basically it comes down to this. There are two ways of looking at the world. One is science. We do experiments. You take observations. And the other is through faith. It's a spiritual way of looking at the world, and that is accessed by faith. You can't do experiments on faith. You can't take observations on faith. And they're separate, these two things. And it's perfectly possible to be a completely regular scientist and have a deep personal religious conviction. Ken Miller is a great case in point of a, a Christian who has made that reconciliation. Probably the most influential scientist in the U.S. today, who is Francis Collins. He's heads of the National Institutes of Health, which is a major funding body for, for most life sciences research in the U.S. He was a very important player in the Human Genome Project and so on. He's a Christian, a deeply committed Christian. He's written a book about how you can be a Christian, how you can have religious belief and be a good scientist. That's the message we have to get out to wherever, in Eastern Anatolia or wherever, where it's not either or, it's yes, both on board are just fine. That's the message we have to get out. It, and it, look, that's 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 a big ask. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your enlightening answers, Professor Barry. Our next is to Professor Piers. Could you tell us a little bit about the project you are carrying out with your laboratory and Tropical Forest Science Center to protect the protect biodiversity? in Southeast Asian forest and your approach to this issue? Uh, so we've been working um, for some time now with the Center for Tropical Forest Science, um, uh, now called the CTFS slash Forest Geo, um, partly run through the Smithsonian. Um, and uh, the concept of that organization is that uh, in order to really understand uh, biodiversity, the dynamics of what uh, pre preserves biodiversity in tropical areas, you need to uh, be able to um, compare uh, those areas over time. Uh, and so they've set up these forest dynamic plots all over the world. They're called 50 hectare plots sometimes, 
Um, and in each country where they occur, they're, they're, the, they're owned by the, the scientific um, establishment of that country. Um, and, but their memorandum of agreement to be able to come and study all the insects or, or trees, and the focus initially was on looking at the dynamics of forest trees. Um, and so we spent a lot of time working in Thailand uh, setting up um, in a forest dynamic plot in Kaohsiung in Thailand, we um, set up a sampling program for looking at all the insects. Um, but this is over time. So how does it change over time? Do, do we, for example, see a diminishment in the number of insects? Right now, there's quite a lot of concern about how we're losing pollinators, pollinators and other insects. Um, and, uh, and, and the nice thing about being part of this large organization is that every piece of data goes into a large database that is commonly held. And any scientist going and working in these plots contribute to this database so that it's, um, it, it's um, instead of one scientist working here and another one here, um, it, it, it brings all of that together into a framework uh, that allows you to look over time at what's happening in those plots. So, so we worked for a long time in Thailand and that work is ongoing. But um, and, and managed by CTFS, but most of our effort in recent years, uh, my website needs to be updated, is, is, is on, in a CTFS plot in Africa. So we're doing a lot of work in Kenya, um, uh, looking at ant plants and all the insects that live on the ant plants and um, these great forest uh, stands in a, a, a 50 hectare plot. It's actually 150 hectares that we're monitoring in, in, uh, in Kenya and East Africa. So, um, but but uh, it's a fantastic, you go look at their website, it's a fantastic resource for um, uh, learning about uh, the maintenance of diversity in the tropics, which of course is where most of the diversity is held. Yeah. Thank you for your answers. Um, I have another question for uh, Professor Pierce. Um, Actually, you can uh, uh, answer it with Mr. Barry too, if you want to. Um, it looks like currently the hu human evolution is wider than just natural selection, and we are harming the nature more and more, so it gets much harder to keep our fragile species alive. How long do you think this destroy other li lives to live technique will work? Someone asked. I'll That's let you idiot. take that, Nami. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very depressing. I mean, there is a lot of, there are economists and, uh, and biologists who use game theory to try to look at these sorts of questions of um, uh, pain forward or um, and what happens when there's not direct feedback for your own actions. So we can act very selfishly now, destroy the environment. Um, because we won't be around uh, in the in the next generation or several generations on to look at to deal with the consequences. And so, how do you curb people's actions so that they don't do that when the feedback is not going to happen to them in their lifetimes? And and I think that the main way is to be conscious that this is what we're doing, and to, and really to impose. Um, um, Sanctions that take place between individuals. In other words, a kind of a, there's a there's a whole theory, area of political theory um, involved in uh, uh, reputation. So reputation is something you can lose very quickly by the opinion the opinions of other people around you. And and to the extent that people express those opinions, especially young people um, like yourselves, uh, express that opinion that really they don't want to see governments um, uh, employ strategies that uh, uh, that use energy non-sustainably and uh, or they don't want to see uh, levels of pollution so high that uh, or pesticides use so high that it uh, kills all the pollinators and uh, uh, that's the way to change things um, and uh, is, is through um, <laughs> I hate to say it, but through a kind of public shaming, but but this is this is what uh, this is this is where we get into. This is not evolutionary biology. This is political process. How do you stop people from uh, from wrecking the planet? 
So. And I think, Naomi, you touched on an important thing there. Uh, all the polls and indicators show it. There is a gulf in terms of the difference in attitude between people of our generations, I'm ashamed to say, and people of your generation, you guys out there. Uh, you guys have been raised on a diet of climate change, of global crisis, of environmental catastrophe. You think about it, it's a very, it's a very pressing and personal thing, whereas you look at the unfortunately in power set of people at the oh, moment, so. which is which is just about opportunism. I mean, uh, you can you can look at the Turkish government. You can t look at the uh, U.S. government. Uh, it doesn't. It's pretty much the same story. So, I mean, I agree. It's it's difficult to be optimistic, and I, I thought Naomi's point was really a, a, a deep one, which is uh, we're dealing with a situation we haven't been we haven't evolved to deal with. We evolved to deal with immediate crises, okay? So I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm, that I'm walking across the savannah in Africa. There's a lion running there. I know what to do. I've got the appropriate uh, hormonal adrenaline response and so on and so forth. That's what we've evolved for, those kind of short-term phenomena. And maybe even, you know, yes, I need to store food from one season to the next. But the notion that something, my actions now are going to have severe consequences 50, 100 years down the road, uh, just something we're not biologically set up to deal with. But I do, but it's about changing consciousness. And that's where the planet's hope has to lie in you guys. I mean, not specifically you guys, uh, but your generation. So yes, it's doom and gloom, but I see a glimmer of light on the horizon. Okay, now I have a question for Professor Berry. Um, one of our participants asked, can you also talk about more modern definitions of species? Because reproductive isolation would fail to distinguish Neanderthals and sapiens as separate species or defining prokaryotes. Oh, that's a super cool question, yes. So traditionally, it's been very simple uh, that you define species as whether or not they are capable of interbreeding. Obviously, you can't generally apply that. Okay, if I find two beetles that look somewhat alike on a rainforest expedition, what am I going to do? I'm going to hope that's male, that's female, and put them together. But even then, it's an artificial situation, so they might breed in my plastic tube, whereas they wouldn't normally. So, so what do we actually do in practice? Well, what we actually do in practice is we look at that beetle and say it's sufficiently different from this beetle, we'll call it a different species. That's what it comes down to. And look, there's obviously good congruence between that idea, which you might call a morphological species concept, and the biological species concept, which is this idea of reproductive isolation. Why are those two beetles different? Because they're not exchanging genes. Okay, therefore, they are diverging in terms of their morphology. Um, but look, speciation by definition is a slow process. Um, so we take it back to 7 million years ago, where you've got the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. There's no question on both criteria, a morphological species concept and a biological species concept that humans and chimpanzees are different species. Good. But if you go back to 3 million years ago, when they're still somewhat similar to their common ancestor, were they different species then. And the Neanderthal is a beautiful case in point. People looked at Neanderthals and said, look, it's sufficiently different. They've applied, if you like, a uh, morphological species concept. But then we find out using the really super cool techniques of ancient DNA that, no, we could interbreed with Neanderthals. So certainly on the biological, the reproductive isolation criterion, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are the same species, whereas, as I say, traditionally, we've defined them as differently. Uh, and Okay, I'm not that excited by any such debate. What we've got is a process which occurs gradually, and eventually you're going to reach full reproductive isolation. So, and the Neanderthal Homo sapiens situation is halfway along. We're not reproductively isolated, but we're really quite different. 
And so it just becomes a semantic issue. Do you call them different species because they're sufficiently different despite the lack of reproductive isolation? Or do you insist that different species have to be re reproductively isolated? So it's just a matter of what your definition is. Final footnote, which I think is important to this argument, which is let's, and let's take Neanderthals. Neanderthals interbred with modern humans probably, what, 70,000 years ago. Neanderthals had been around for in Europe and Western Asia for Middle East for about 400,000 years already by that stage. They were quite different. I mean, definitely, you can tell it easily from their bones. The interesting thing is, if they were truly one species, they would then have merged. And you wouldn't have Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, you just have one population, right? But that's not what happened. So you had the interbreeding, as I say, 70,000 years ago. Neanderthals didn't go extinct until about 30,000 years ago. So that means that for about 40,000 years ago, despite the ability to exchange genes, these two populations remain distinct, which suggests that maybe natural selection was keeping, keeping those two populations separate, which would add to the, you know, those who want to insist that Neanderthals are a good species, that would, would lend uh, ammunition to their cause. But yeah, look, bottom line, species are complicated things and it's a messy process. It's a gradual process. There isn't going to be a one, one day when you're not a species and a new day when you are a species, right? That's not going to happen. Um, what it is, is uh, therefore an issue of semantics and definitions. I don't think that makes it any less interest, interesting, but we do have to admit there aren't these simple categories that things fall into. Look who's arrived. <laughs> Hello, nice how you, are you guys? N nice, nice to, to see, see you. you. Just wanted to come and say hi. You can just finish it. Um, I'm not going to interrupt. We can just uh, talk after the uh, Q&A session, maybe after the live. Mm -hmm. um, OK, then now many people have asked the same question related to your presentation, Professor Barry. Uh, what do you think will be the future of the evolutionary process in the human population? Do you have assumptions regarding this matter? They're asking. Uh <laughs> Good question. It sort of pertains to the question that you asked Nermi earlier about, you know, the fact that we're devastating the planet, what's going to happen to us. Uh, and one concern that people always say, well, look, we've, uh, we're emasculating, we're eviscerating natural selection because previously people who would have died would have been selected out of the population, go to hospital or get put on antibiotics or whatever and do fine. Um, but no, natural selection is still operating in our population. I hate to say it, it's operating in a very discernible way at the moment vis-a-vis -vis COVID, right? There are certain uh, sectors of the population and certain genotypes, it seems, which are especially susceptible to COVID. That's, so that's natural selection. It's not like natural selection has stopped working. OK, that's the first thing to say. Second thing to say, I'm going to go back into my historian of science mode. Uh, in 1900, so we've got the 20th century stretching ahead. Everyone's very excited. We're moving out of the 19th century into the 20th century. Lots of smart people, including Wallace, this is why I know about it. Well, lots of smart people were asked to write, what do you think is going to happen in the 20th century? And these were the best and the brightest people thinking about what was going to happen. And you've got, and they're interesting to read, but boy, are they wacky. I mean, they, these are smart people trying to predict the future, technology, politics, and everything else. And it, you read these things with the benefit of hindsight, and you just think they're, you know, losers, right? Now, these guys weren't losers. These were the smartest, best thinkers of their era trying to solve this problem of the future. The future is unknowable. Now, we can make some smart guesses about things. I mean, we know climate change is underway. We know sea level is going to rise. So the components of the future, which are unknowable. But let, let's say we have sea rise. Florida's underwater. What's unknowable is what happens. Is it going to be an, an army of, of now very wet Floridians moving north, desperate to, to repossess Georgia or something? I mean, I don't know. The, the point is that you really can't predict future conditions. And evolution 
is a response to conditions. So if I can't predict what the environment's going to be, what the conditions which under which natural selection is going to be operating, if I can't predict that, then I'm out of luck, right? So I, I take any sort of strong claim about this is the direction human evolution is going in or this direction with a very serious pinch of salt. Okay, uh, thanks to professors Andrew Berry and Neum Pierce again for their answers. Uh, and we appreciate your contribution. Uh, you are with us like for two hours. It's invaluable for us. Uh, now I think Charmart Bakırcı has something to say. Actually, I was just here to listen. And um, so I just wanted to thank both of you guys. It's it's just, I mean, uh, Dr. Barry's excitement <laughs> and how, 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 how much uh, he, how passionate he is about uh, all of this is just, just uh, empowers me. And Dr. Pierce's presentation was awesome because uh, I have an engineering background and um, and I, I've also worked with biomimicry when I was uh, doing my, my um, uh, internship in Denmark. And we looked at uh, all sorts of things like the uh, production, uh, the the stratification of the muscles, uh, for example, and or the uh, how birds move in, in in big colonies, you know, starlings and stuff. So it it was just beautiful. I just wanted to say that. Thank you both for for your presentations. Well, thank you guys for having us. It's a, a privilege to be part. I say both of of the uh, Tree of Evolution and of the Science Club at uh, Boisichi. Um, especially as, yes, I mean, both are highly topical. There's ever more misinformation out there in the scientific domain. I live, I've just lived for four years in a, um, in a country run by an orange hued idiot who was <laughs> deeply anti-science. Uh, that's one. And two, what's going on on campus, uh, in Istanbul at, uh, BU is, uh, well, sobering, depressing, but simultaneously inspiring that you guys are not going to sit back and let uh, the Erdogan government just park second-rate administrators, stool pigeons into important administrative positions. So I think uh, so. This is this is timely, important, and we appreciate and are privileged to be part of both of your uh, sets of activities. Thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed this a lot and the questions were excellent. So it's funny because Andrew goes every year uh, to lecture in Turkey and I, I have rarely gone with him. I, I think maybe the very first year and then not for 20 years after, but, uh, um, but it's, uh, it's really fun to see how it, <laughs> to meet some of the students and hear what you're doing and so on. And I enjoy talking about biomimicry. Someone asked me what, uh, in just in the chat, what's the best model for um, uh, for biomimicry? And and uh, and of course, I think insects are fantastic. The, the things like not wet, um, the wings don't get wet, and uh, so you can make a non-wettable surface. And there are tremendous applications. But actually, there's no question in my mind that maybe the most important in our generation, the most important innovation from biomimicry came from mimicking bacteria. And this was in the invention of CRISPR. So you know that um, uh, that that you can use CRISPR to uh, chop up DNA and uh, and create uh, new combinations of DNA very easily. Now it's completely revolutionized um, molecular genetics. Uh, and uh, but that CRISPR technique came from came out of um, uh, uh, studying bacteria. Actually, in that sense, it's actually it was robbed directly from the bacteria themselves. But I. But the, yeah, that I sorry, that's not mimicry. That's outright <laughs> theft. That's but plagiarism. It, it's the same process. It's the same idea is mining mining nature to look for tools that have been crafted to do exactly what you would like them to do. And in general, nature, because evolution has worked on this for so many millions of years, is that you get better answers much more quickly if you go. Uh, looking and prospecting in nature. So, um, so I would, uh, to me, that would be an, an example of uh, uh, really taking this 
approach much further in using uh, uh, using nature to innovate uh, tool development of different kinds. Um, <clears throat> so if anyone has nothing to say <laughs> to finish, mm -hmm. I just want to uh thank you again i know we like uh, uh thanks a lot in this presentation but um i want to thank andrew berry and Naomi pierce because of their prompt replies because of their interest in the situation because of their try to uh like spread scientific information just like us um many thanks to them and we appreciate your contribution a lot. It's invaluable for us. So yeah, we thank a lot to us, to you. Uh, I have a note. Uh, we will continue with Shinya Yamamoto from Kyoto University and Brian Hare from Duke University on the 6th of March. Uh, we will be waiting for you to join us. Thank you. <laughs>